Hello, ah, now we're working. Hello there, everybody. So yeah, I do a lot of entertainment, and uh, the key important fact is I am not a software engineer, and I do not design hardware professionally. So I ask a simple question, why do it the hard way? Um, if you were here last year, you may have seen my LED cube. I had 64 LEDs that I controlled with nine pins on a at Mega 328P. Uh, the thing was, is I it was my first real time going beginning to end on my own writing firmware. My firmware was slow and inefficient. I didn't get the dimming resolution that I wanted. I didn't get the frame rate that I wanted. Because of that, it was hard to debug, very time consuming, and I was late leaving Las Vegas, so I missed most of Friday badge hacking, and nobody likes that. So for my next project, uh, the details of it don't matter, it didn't come to much, but I, for one simple problem I wanted was to read an analog value, if it was high enough to be interesting, do something. And I was, oh dear, analog reads, how much time do you spend in the ADC loop versus trying to do normal code? And as I was flipping through the data sheet, I saw this. And you just read those first two sentences. The analog comparator compares the input value on the positive pin and the negative pin. When the voltage on the positive pin is higher than the voltage on the negative pin, the analog output is on. What? This thing will do it for me? I don't have to do any analog read, nothing. It'll all do it in hardware, no cycles. This blew my mind, and I was, okay, what else am I missing in this 300-page data sheet? <laughs> so, now I've identified a new problem that spawned this talk. Data sheets are long and a challenging read. Uh, that, that manual that I took that out of is for the AT Tiny 48. It is 234 pages long, cross-reference back and forth all over the place. Uh, feature discoverability is hard. If you take that manual and search for analog compare, you get zero results. If you search for analog comparator, you get 71 results, including that really useful diagram. So even if you know what you want to find, you may not know the right word because there might be technical language in, in the way. It's something that I really suffer from is tunnel vision. If I can see the problem and how it should be solved in code, I'll try and do it myself and not look for easier and better tools. So what I'm, tr what I'm gonna try and do with this talk is give, is give you something to do about this problem. Obviously, we wanna build more stuff. Find new problems, do something we've never done before. But while we're doing that, we wanna work smarter, not harder. The guys that build chips get paid a lot of money, they're really smart, I have faith in them, so use the tools they give us. Uh, yeah, lean on their tools and don't read and bet the wheel unless you have to. So first steps, uh, if you are comfortable in Arduino but haven't you know, really dove into uh, making something straight off the MCU with tools, a lot of MCUs have pull-up and pull-down resistors. It makes your breadboard cleaner, makes your life easy. Uh, you could give a three-hour workshop on timers, counters, and interrupts. Uh, that's not me. Someone way smarter needs to do that. But uh, if you haven't actually set up an interrupt, set up a timer on your own, I really encourage you to Google it. There's examples on every platform out there. You can grab an Arduino, skip all the Arduino bits where they try and make it easy on you, and just write C code, set up a timer, set up PWM. I like LEDs, LEDs blink with PWM, nice and easy. And it'll get you started in writing your own actual firmware instead of just noodling around, which I like to do too. So something else, a couple more things that may help you find tools. Just, I really find the technical terminology is what has been my big, biggest barrier thus far. So a couple details on the analog compare and a lot of MCUs, I'm gonna try and jump around from vendor to vendor here. Uh, the voltage reference is also tied in with the analog thing. So reading in an ADC can be challenging in your own firmware. Uh, the Arduino source analog read is 60 lines of code. So if you're running a 328P at its maximum speed of 16 megahertz, and I, I didn't run the analog read through a um, compiler analysis, but let's say it's 10 cycles. That means you have 170 cycles for the entire rest of your program. That's, that's not much. You know, you're wasting a lot of time there. So if you can use tools in hardware, that are you're going to save cycles, you know. Uh, this is all not useful. So in the uh, Freescale <laughs> KE4 family from NXP, 
uh, they have an analog comparator just like the ATtiny does. Um, in, in the Freescale version, you actually can set your voltage reference. You're not fixed at one. It's full scale. You get you know 164 steps. It's really a really nice piece of tool. It's hysteresis is nice if you're right there at your voltage reference. You're not freaking out your microcontroller. And uh, you can either send the output directly to a pin, or you can use an interrupt depending on what you want. And the cool thing that I didn't know was, uh, existed was it works during sleep mode. So if you want your device to be cool like your cell phone, and if it's completely dead and you plug it in, and when, it get, when the voltage gets to a useful voltage where it can turn on, it can just do that on its own. One line of code. So. My, uh, to show you how easy this is, we'll solve a problem right here on stage. If I want, I have an LED that I want to turn on when the power on an input pin is more than 1.2 volts. Might be, might be battery charging, might be uh, you know, solar harvesting, who knows? How do we do that? Four lines of code. You know, we do the control and setup register, turn the analog comparator on, connect the pin to the output. That's not hard. Uh, in the control register zero, connect which pin goes to positive, which pin goes to negative. Control register one, set the, uh, they call it VBG. By the way, this code and image are directly from the Freescale uh, example code. This isn't something I made up, this is something they give you to make it easy. So they, uh, if you're wondering why I switched from VBG to VRF, uh, or VREF, that's why. Um, band gap is something they use to make the reference. It's a semiconductor physics thing that I don't understand. But we set it at 1.14, which is close enough to 1.2 for me, and then I select an input pin. And that's it. If you put two volts on input pin zero, that LED will light up. If you put 0.5 volts, it'll turn off. You know, we've solved a problem in five lines of code. The other thing that I wish I had known about years ago is uh, I first learned it as pin change interrupt. PIC likes to be different, so of course they call it interrupt on change. Super search friendly, right? Um, but it's basically exactly what it sounds like. Your code runs along, does whatever it's doing, you know, solving the world, figuring out when the next earthquake's gonna be, and then you push a button, and it goes, oh, oh god, a button's been pushed, we gotta stop. So on the PIC16 family, there's, you have eight inputs that you can set to inter interrupt the, um, the program whenever a button's pressed. You can do a rising edge, falling edge, or both, depending on what you need. This takes a little bit more code, but we can still solve it right here on the stage. So we, first four lines, we're just turning stuff on. You know, what, is it an input, is it an output, is it an analog? Turn the interrupts on. The second four lines of code there is just, it's again, straight off the example software. It's just how the PIC family recommends that you deal with interrupts. Uh, yeah, the, you t the pin manager IOC is a, pr is a function that we'll write that's our real code, but then we just turn it all, then we reset things when interrupts happen. This is basically all that we need to do is, in the pin manager code, to do. Add handling code for IOC. So this is straight out of the example. If you put that in your code, you will have a pin change interrupt on pin four. And like I said, your software can save the world and when you push button four, an LED will switch or something. Uh, so now that I've kind of gotten used to some of the more traditional 8-bit, 16-bit uh, microcontrollers, we have ARM. It's a new thing. Uh, it's not really that new. They've been around for a while, but they go super fast. It is uh, more modern, 32, 64-bit MCUs. A, a lot of times, it's cheaper to buy, a, to buy a nicer ARM than it is an older AVR or PIC. And uh, just because they're big and powerful doesn't mean they should be scary. I say that, and then you go to the ARM Info Center, and they give you a wonderfully detailed graphic like this. What in the world does that mean? This is what it means. Some, some really smart person in ARM had a great idea, hey, a lot of times we need to access a single, bit, a single byte in a, in a register, uh, but who wants to do a bunch of shifting and, and not in logical operations? If we just have a, an area in memory where we have an 8-bit eight, eight byte that is also mapped to 8 bytes, 
then you can access them individually. So on the top, you have oh, one, blah, blah, you know, 70, uh, 72. But on the bottom, you've also got 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. And if I take that register all the way on the bottom right and make that a 1, the register on the top becomes 73. Nice and easy, no shifting. Again, when someone explains that to you, that may not make a lot of sense. But here it is in code. On the top, if registers shifting on sense equal equal one logical operation not, ugh, that's terrible. Or if alias register six is equal to one, make it zero. That's so much easier. And not only is it easier to understand when you're coming back to it after a couple months trying to understand your code, the top line there is seven cycles. The bottom line, depending on your compiler, could be as few as three. So you can run, you can almost run the bottom line three times for every time the top line runs once. If this is something you need to do several thousand times a second, you're, you're, you can buy a cheaper microcontroller, you can, do some, you can do another feature, you can add a whole other section to your code just because you're using the tools that are given to you instead of trying to do it yourself the hard way. Um, I'm, I, when I wrote these slides, I assumed I'd be running low on time, uh, and I think I kind of am. But as I was, I read a bunch of data sheets as I was doing this talk, and this is what I found. There are other really cool features that I wish I had more time to implement. Uh, pseudo random PWM. Uh, this is the PSOC 4 from Cypress. They have a built in, you can just throw PWM out and it'll just make up a interval. If you want a blinky LED or a test feature or just anything where random would be good, but you don't want to take the time to build a random number generator, find a lot, who cares, that's terrible. It'll do it in the hardware for you. Every time it, every time it completes the cycle, just make up a new number, great. Another PSOC feature, Boolean logic. They have an entire Boolean uh, segment in front of your I.O. between the actual pin and the microcontroller. So if you want to do something, if button two and three, but not four and not five are pressed, you can do that in logic and in a single hardware cycle. It'll, if that's the state, it'll just give you an interrupt and you're done. And there's not a whole lot of edge case testing. You know, if you don't have to figure out, oh, but what happens if I put push button four at that time too? You know, it's it's. It's in the hardware as Boolean, it, it works great. The other thing, this is one that I've lost a lot of time on in one project, uh, quadrature decoding. Uh, the place you're gonna see this a lot is encoders. Uh, let's say you're building a drone and it's spinning, you know, your propellers are spinning at several thousand RPM. You're probably, you're gonna want an encoder on there to figure out how fast it's moving. But you may not have time to test what happens when you overflow the, you know, 64-bit unsigned long that you're using for position, you can just use the encoder hardware decoding and again, trust the smart people that make the tools that you're using. Uh, the last, this isn't really a feature, but it's something that I found was poorly documented in data sheets is uh, PLLs. Again, it stands for phase lock loop. It's a way to take a a clock and make it faster, semiconductor physics that uh, Mike has said not to call magic, but in my eyes are magic. <laughs> um, but several uh, microcontrollers will allow you to set your clock frequency, you know, one to eight megahertz, whatever, and then they have an entire another section where the, you can turn on a PLL to make it even faster. So like on a PIC24, you set your clock speed to eight megahertz is as fast as it can go, and maybe your program isn't running as fast as you'd like it to. But if it has a times two and a times four PLL that is just you know, 50 pages later in the data sheet. So you can turn that on, and all of a sudden, your code that was close to running right, but not quite fast enough, now you've got time for activities in between. You know, you run four times faster with just reading the data sheet. It's great. So I. Don't recommend that you read 300 pages cover to cover plus all of the example code, but hopefully a couple of these words or things that can pop up, I really suggest that you look at people's projects, you know, maybe me, hopefully someone that's writing better software than me and like, 
what cool features saved your last project? Like what, what was in there that you discovered that made, that made your life easy? Because that's really what I'm, what the question that I need to ask more myself and the people around me more when I'm building projects is, how can I take this and make it not a, uh, you know, how do I not bang my head against the wall? Um, Again, like I said, I'm not a software engineer, I'm an enthusiast, but I think there's a little thinking like an enthusiast can help. Decent code can be good code, and it, you could even argue it's great code. Uh, if you're a professional and you're selling a million of something, perhaps it's worth it to write your own UART driver to save two cycles per you know, operation. But the odds are is that if you're building one or two or five of something, you're, you don't need to optimize for that. You know, sure, maybe it's not gonna get you an A in a computer science final, but if, it's, if it, your code is running and it's doing what you want, you to, it, you want it to do, that's great code. Um, again, fast development is way more fun. If I can use the tools from the hardware manufacturer and I don't have to test a billion edge cases and debug all of them and figure out all of the off by ones because I can't do math on some days, you know, that makes it way more fun. I finish projects, and then I want to start new ones. And when I do succeed, that means I want to take on bigger challenges. Now that I remember to use the pin change interrupt, you know, I, I have that tool in my tool bag. I don't need to start from zero. I've got that. Now I can take on something more challenging. And uh, especially when you're building just a few of something, spend money in exchange for optimization. On my LED cube, uh, the 328P at the time was $2. If I had spent $2.70, I could have gotten an ATX Mega 6, uh, 32 that runs twice as fast. And then I could have gotten the dimming I wanted, I would have had to spend way less time banging my head against optimization, and it, it just would have been a way better project, and then I could have been here for badge hacking on Friday. That's it, thank you very much. Uh, I'm really happy you didn't read my entire introduction, but uh, I'm graduating in December with an electrical engineering degree that I've been working on for about 14 years. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> if uh, anybody needs a guy whose favorite programming language is solder, come talk to me, please. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>